When construction workers were excavating this deep tunnel access portal, they were amazed to come across relics from another time, as they unearthed pieces of an amusement park ride just left here in the ground. But it didn't take long for these locals to connect the dots, as like any Chicago native, they recalled family stories about the best amusement park on earth, Riverview Park. You see, it was here, in place of the soccer field, that the Shoot the Shoots boat ride once was. And when the ride itself was dismantled, all the underground elements were just abandoned in place. And you see this radio tower? Well, that was the location of the Grand Parachute Ride. But it was here, in this Walgreens parking lot, that the Chicagoans would pass through the main gate, embracing a notion of laughing their troubles away. A notion that has not existed here for quite some time. So with so much lost, you might wonder what remains. Join me to find out, as today we discover the history of Chicago's lost amusement park. This is the story of Riverview. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The year was 1879 when German war veteran and sharpshooter William Schmidt established a live shooting range not far from the corner of Belmont and Western. The range consisted of paper targets on the bank and floating targets in the river. Unfortunately, not everyone was thrilled, and the wives of nearby residents complained about the range. Perhaps as a measure of good PR, Schmidt elected to open the space to families for picnics on Sundays. The relaxing landscape and quiet space became such a popular hidden gem of the city that ultimately, the owner built a playground for children and a bandstand for concerts, eliminating the range aspect altogether. By 1903, William Schmidt had made a fortune after having sold his soda cracker invention and the Sedgwick Street Bakery to the National Biscuit Company. The timing couldn't have been more perfect, since fellow Chicago businessman and colleague George Goldman had been persuading him to build an amusement park like the ones he saw during his studies in Europe, but for Chicago. So the two teamed up, buying out an additional 22 acres, six of which were leased to operators from the East Coast, tasked with building Chicago's finest amusement park. Riverview Sharpshooters Park, as it was initially called, opened on July the 3rd, 1904, to a massive attendance of 32,000 visitors paying a nickel fare. Aside from the scenic park that the Chicagoans had already come to love, there were only three attractions on opening day. There was the White Flyer, a wooden figure-eight-shaped coaster that was powered by a steam engine and thrilled riders with a six-foot drop. Then we have a merry-go-round, which also happens to be the only lasting relic of the park, but more on that later. The Thousand Island Boat Ride was brought to Chicago for the World's Fair, which Chicagoans had already considered an old classic by the time, and they were thrilled to see it reappear at the new park. By 1905, the park's name was changed to Riverview, and by 1910, it was expanded to 140 acres and 100 attractions, making it one of the most extensive parks on Earth. The park was almost universally loved, with the only honest downside being that it contributed to record high truancy at Lane Tech High School, conveniently located on the property's northern border. The park would continue to grow, bringing with it some of the most unique attractions the world has ever seen. So before we talk about its ultimate downfall, allow me to take you on a tour of the park in its prime. By 1950, Riverview proclaimed itself the largest amusement park in the United States, with a staff of over 1,000. At the time, most visitors arrived by car and would enter lots off of Western and Belmont. Those coming by foot enjoyed access via the closest L-stop at Addison off the Red Line. You could also catch a variety of trolley cars, and the park was easy to find since the Chicago surface lines indicated Riverview as a point of interest. Guests would enter the main ticket booth, beyond which was a grand display area, tilt whirl, mini train, and lagoon. Following the Central Boulevard, guests were led to the Silver Slash, Arcade, Blue Streak, and a Freak Show, where a man who would later become Wizzo on the Bozo Show would entertain massive crowds of visitors. Further down that same road was a legendary boat ride named the Chutes. Not far from there was the Tunnel of Love, where many men were said to have, quote, stolen their first kiss, and in this area was also the Whips and the Picnic Field. On the internal path towards the Belmont side of the park, there was also a shooting gallery, flying scooters, 
the bobs, parachutes, and perhaps what became the most recognizable attraction of the entire park, Aladdin's castle, with its famous so-called skirt blowers, which were a series of hidden floor nozzles that would randomly blast air upwards, lifting the skirts of women who exited the ride. It's almost impossible to imagine a world like that these days, with people able to embrace a sense of humor during their big day out at the park. And even if this one attraction would create a media nightmare for the park by today's standards, Riverview, at the time, was dealing with an entirely different set of challenges. By the late 1950s, a nickel couldn't buy what it once did. Maintenance costs were rising, and that turn-of-the-century charm the park had embraced for so long was rapidly decaying. Park ownership was passed down one generation and still belonged to the Schmidt family. Even so, they elected to get out fast. However, according to many, there's more to the story. You see, the park was something of a political flashpoint for Chicago. Civil rights activists and publications used Riverview as a relatable reference for many of their causes for decades, proving to be highly inconvenient for the ruling class. Articles from publications like the Chicago Defender described African-American visitors as being subject to overt racism. And with attraction names like Dunk the N-Word, later renamed African Dip, the harsh reputation was no wonder. However, the damage had been done by the time the park tried to clean up its appearance in the 1950s, following pressure from the NAACP. In fact, when Martin Luther King visited Chicago in 1966, Chicago Mayor Richard J. Daley shut down the park to avoid civil unrest. A more recent publication titled Race, Riots, and Roller Coasters also offered commentary on the history, stating, quote, You see a lot of this when African Americans begin going in large numbers to amusement parks. The parks are increasingly associated with danger and criminality. However, beyond claims from both sides of the argument, it isn't easy to establish the clear truth. One Chicago Tribune article from late 1967 blames violence for the park's closure, whereas modern activists argue that there's no evidence for claims like that and blame the situation on white flight. Indeed, there were other complications along the way. For example, Mayor William Hale Thompson, also known as Big Bill, closed the city's schools to take 18,000 children on a picnic to the park, resulting in furious protests from parent-teacher associations who felt the outing was totally inappropriate. There was also an incident of an unusual wedding ceremony on roller skates, where a woman with a, quote, controversial appearance of Amazonia would, quote, shimmy before spectators for a nickel. But the safety record was without a doubt the most widely contested issue. Even back then, the precarious nature of the ride designs were apparent. For example, the Bobs was considered the park's scariest roller coaster as it lifted riders out of their seat and then bashed them into a fixed metal bar, meaning riders not holding on tightly would end up with bruises or worse from the rough movements. The Silver Flash had train carriages similar to the Burlington Express, and since they were mostly enclosed, passengers had zero restraint. No buckle, no lap bar, no nothing. As far back as July of 1937, 72 people were injured when one roller coaster train crashed into the rear end of another. Now, the park owner, who literally grew up at Riverview, would alleviate these concerns by being the first passenger on each ride upon season opening. And to further guarantee safety, ride operators were obliged to walk the entirety of the tracks for inspection on a daily basis. So with that in mind, what we can observe for sure is that white flight happened in this area, attendance to the park dropped in the same decade, real estate taxes increased, and one way or another, the park closed. I'll leave conclusions up to you. Please feel free to elaborate your perspectives in the comment section below. Anyhow, the property was ultimately sold to a LaSalle Street investment firm, which then resold the park to a paper manufacturer for a reported $6 million. However, that amount has also been the subject of great debate. Following the park's final day, a small auction of 50 prospective ride buyers took place. However, most iconic rides, such as the parachute jump, space ride, fish high ride, or Bob's roller coaster, were passed on, ending up as scrap. The story was the same for other classics like the Fireball, the Wild Mouse, the Silver Streak, the Comet, and the Greyhound. And of course, the Shoot the Shoots ride, which, as I mentioned earlier, was partly rediscovered in the ground by Chicago's deep tunnel workers. The more miniature rides like the Ferris Wheel, the Mini Train, and Children's Rides were sold off to carnivals, and no one really knows what became of them in the modern day. 
News of the park's closure was made public on October the 4th, 1967, with the Tribune headline reading, quote, Chicago era comes to an end, Riverview Park to be raised. The newspaper read, Riverview was the last of the big amusement parks that once dotted the city 40 years ago. It was the only one in Chicago since White City at 63rd Street and South Park Avenue went out of business in the Great Depression of the 1930s. For generations, it was a part of childhood. It's roller coasters and thrill rides, a challenge to boyhood pride since the days of Knickers. The demolition started in 1963, with crews removing 63 years worth of Chicago's most joyful memories in just 36 days. Some nearby residents complained of sawdust in the air, whereas others observed this bizarre sight of roller coaster demolition in awe. Although the park has been gone for over half a century, and most of it was paved over by a shopping center and police station, there are plenty of small relics left behind. You just have to know where to look. Like I said at the top of the video, the foundation of the main ticket booth is still visible, but what about the rides? Well, I was delighted to learn that I actually unknowingly rode one of them hundreds of times as a child when I'd visit Six Flags on my season pass, and I'm sure that many of you also went on the same ride. I'm referring to the rotor, which is a large, spinning barrel-like contraption that once up to speed would have the floor drop out, leaving riders plastered against the wall. This ride was set up at Six Flags and lasted until 2000 when a horrible accident occurred. Unfortunately, the operators raised the floor too soon, trapping a poor girl's legs between the floor and the wall, and the ride was scrapped completely shortly after. The passenger cars from the Bobs and the Fireball roller coasters were sold to Adventureland in Addison to be used on roller coasters there. However, as we can see in the satellite image, that park has long since closed, and it can be assumed that the cars were scrapped. However, we might have to make a video about that one to find out for sure. Anyhow, the only surviving relic that is still in use today, somewhat poetically perhaps, is the park's first ride, the five-row carousel. This breathtaking merry-go-round was bought by the city of Galena and stored in many pieces, some of which were thought to be held in private homes, as the town hoped to set it up as a centerpiece to its highly scenic surroundings. However, for budget considerations, this idea was never realized. The ride was subsequently sold to Six Flags Over Georgia, where it would be relocated and operated to this very day. This unique ride is also a centerpiece of art, as each of the 72 customized horses and four chariots were hand-carved by Swiss and Italian immigrants, giving it that touch of mastery. And with that in mind, Chicago was generally essential to the development of the amusement park industry. Even Walt Disney's own father, who was a construction worker at the 1983's World Fair, later visited Riverview, leading many to feel that it was a direct inspiration on his son's work. And what I find moving about this whole story is that even though Riverview was perhaps Chicago's most iconic park, it didn't take long to replace. There was Addison's short-lived Adventureland, followed by the 1975 opening of Marriott's Great America, which rose from the fields of what had once been Gurney Farms. Their vision was grander than just serving Chicago, as the park was strategically located to serve 27 million people who lived within a two-hour drive. And it might even be argued that the existence of this park transformed that entire region into a sprawling suburban metropolis. Six Flags Great America was the park that everyone from my generation grew up with. We hadn't even really heard of Chicago's Riverview, nor would we have believed that something as spectacular as a roller coaster was once within walking distance of an L-stop. What's more, in the 1980s and 1990s, that part of Chicago was disheveled and dangerous. Hence, had there been an amusement park to visit, we certainly would not have come, perhaps confirming the reason for the park's closure in the first place. But enough with my memories. I'm more curious to hear yours. Do you have any family stories from Riverview? Let's preserve them now by sharing them in the comments section below. Also, hit that subscribe button if you'd like for me to make an episode about Addison's Lost Adventureland. I'll make a deal. If we get 500 new subscribers from this video, I'll write that script next. Otherwise, I thank you all for watching, and until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.